welcome everybody. Thank you so much for attending. I want to thank the people behind the scenes, which are Dorit Jordan Dotam, Cheslin Amato, and Ghana Wiesenthal Elias for helping with the program. Of course, Judith Joseph, who's been curating this particular session, and very much Aaron Rosen and Jonathan Hamrichhausen for presenting today. Back to you, Judith. Thank you so much. Um, we have a wonderful program today. We have uh, Jonathan Homerighausen, who curated an, a virtual art exhibit at the Henry Luce III Center, of which Aaron Rosen is the director. And um, I'm going to read their bios briefly. Jonathan Homerighausen is a doctoral student in Hebrew Bible at Duke University. He writes and researches at the intersection of Hebrew Bible, calligraphic art, and scribal craft. He's the author of two books and numerous articles. He is currently teaching in Judaic studies at the College of Wil William and Mary and preparing a dissertation on the ritual, metaphorical, and material significance of writing in the Book of Esther and its reception. Dr. Aaron Rosen is Professor of Religion and Visual Culture and Director of the Henry Luce III Center for the Arts and Religion at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, DC, and visiting professor at King's College London, where he taught previously. He began his career at Yale, Oxford, and Columbia after receiving his PhD from Cambridge. He has curated exhibitions around the world and written widely for scholarly and popular publications. He is the author and editor of many books, and he is a member of the advisory board of the Jewish Art Salon. And I'd like to welcome members of the Chicago Calligraphy Collective, who I noticed during the program, and other calligraphers and members of this exhibition. So Jonathan, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Judith, and thank you all for coming here today. Let me get my screen queued up. Perfect. So today I'd like to talk about an art form that many of you, I, I know many of you appreciate. I've seen already at least one slant writing table in the background and a few names that I know from calligraphy world. And at least one of the artists I'll be talking about today, I see his name on the participants list. So I'm very excited that you've all come here this afternoon or evening or whatever time it is in your time zone. So today I'd like to talk about this exhibit that I've curated for the Luce Center on calligraphy and sacred text. You can go to the looseartsandreligion.org slash visual music and find it. There are 15 works and every work is by somebody who's living. I wanted it to be a very contemporary collection of works because um, I think often we often think of calligraphy and, and everybody knows the medievals did it, but it's very much alive and well as an art form. I first got into the intersection of calligraphy and sacred text through the St. John's Bible, which was done by a Roman Catholic religious order, but it's led me in many other directions, both Jewish and Christian artists, and we will, the St. John's Bible will come up again in our talk today. Um, and in the St. John's Bible, just like Torah scribes write with quill on animal skin, this project was also written with quill on animal skin, but unlike a Torah scroll, also has very colorful images, visual meditations on the text um, that are kind of inspired by many different things, including sometimes Jewish art and Hebrew calligraphy. In working with the St. John's Bible, though, I found that people, many audiences don't have a very, a good set of tools for appreciating how calligraphic art works. So the metaphor that I came up with is the idea of visual music was in part inspired by this woman's work, Anne Heckel. She has, in, in the 80s, did a lot of work in seeking to capture the orality and the musicality of spoken language on the page. So here, this is a series of kind of theme and variations on a line from the Psalms, be still then and know that I am God. And each one, there's a different place where you pause, a different word that might be emphasized, be still then and know that I am God, or be still then and know that I am God. And each one of these has a different sort of emotional valence in the way that the 
um, the orality, the musicality of it plays out. And of course, you could then bring this into conversation with actual musical settings of the song verse. So in this exhibit, Visual Music, of the 15 works, there are four that are by Hebrew calligraphers and another that incorporates some Hebrew. And I wanted to discuss those today because I thought they would be the most, most interest for this audience. The first one is by a man named Michel Denastasio. He was trained as a, he, as a Roman alphabet calligrapher. And then in the 2000s, through genealogical research, discovered he had Jewish ancestry. And in seeking to, to go back and, and understand his past and his heritage, he started doing Hebrew calligraphy. So this is a line also from the Psalms. Uh, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. This is from uh, the Psalm 137. Uh, you know, they, they asked for us to sing us one of the songs of Zion. This is a psalm of lament for being in exile for the diaspora. And here, uh, the letters move. There's thicks and thins. And in every one of these letters, he has the, the broad edge nib, the very thick kind of bold letters of the Hebrew, but then around them in a much finer pointed nib, he kind of outlines the letters. So each one looks like it's dancing. They're really moving around. They're, they're somewhat, uh, they're not perfectly vertical and they're, they're kind of in conversation with one another. And so here's a, a good close up. Part of what I love about this is in the Psalm, the Jews are asked to sing a song of Zion as if they're supposed to sing something joyful. But of course they can't because they've been put into exile, they're mourning, they're traumatized. And so instead of a song of, a song of joy, they're singing, they're singing the blues, it's a lament. And the, the vibrato and the energy of the pain is in the vibration of the letters visually created by the lines around the big bold letters. And this is, this is a kind of one of his signature visual styles. A very different style of Hebrew calligraphy is in Avraham Borshevsky, who was born in Russia, made Aliyah to Israel. And this is a line from Psalm 92, the righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lenin, in Lebanon, sorry. And here the, uh, the, the parchment itself is shaped into, to me, what looks like a very giant palm leaf echoing the palm tree. Borshevsky is both doing a kind of artistic, creative Hebrew calligraphy. He's also a sofer, uh, and his letters are very much inspired by that style. You can look closely and see the tagin on the, the letters on which the tagin are traditionally written. And just as in a line of biblical poetry, often the second the second half of the line is often seen as more intensive than the first, is what scholars call parallelism. Uh, just as a coincidence in the second half of the line, the tagin are more numerous. And at the very bottom in Yishke, there's two letters in a row with tagin and you see he, can, he shapes them in kind of a little, a little mountain. It's very, very skilled and very creative. And the letters themselves are not only in the black, but there's little bits of gold in them. So getting back to uh, another a line, lines from Tanakh about gold being, uh, the, the meat's vote being more valuable than gold, or the fear of God being more valuable than gold. Here, even without any translation, the letters communicate. And even if you don't know Hebrew and many of the audiences outside of Israel who look at this, uh, especially when I was putting together this exhibit for the Luce Center, which is at a Methodist seminary, many of the viewers wouldn't know Hebrew, but the, the letters shapes, their forms communicate. So there's, there's something playful there too. The next artist that I was delighted to feature is Rabbi Wolf, Peretz Wolf Prusan. He is based in California and he, he did Kutubot in the 70s and 80s, then went to rabbinical school, had a long career as a rabbinic, as a rabbi and an educator, 
and now has has gone back to art as a kind of I don't know if he used the word retirement, but um, this back to art is his full time vocation. So this is a line done in a serigraph style from Pierre Vogt. If I am only for myself, what am I? And the the letters at the the words at the top right the last few letters of some of these words are in red. And if you read it like that, then it's just a knee, me, a knee, I, who am I? As if to say, if I'm only for myself, who am I? I have no identity. I'm just a, a, a being in isolation. You, we live in community. And as a response to that, at the bottom, the larger letters on the page is just this giant, bold olive in, in a very stark black. Oh, here I am talking about his work and he just entered. Hello, Rabbi. The irony here is that on the one hand, you could you this olive is kind of in isolation. It's very bold. It stands on its own, but it's still in community with the verse above it because they're all united by the shared negative space, the white space of the page or of the of the um, of the paper. So there, there's always a message here about the relationship with individual and community. And finally, the last of the Hebrew calligraphers proper in this exhibit uh, is Izzy Pludwinski. And he's from America, um, also moved to Israel. And this is a work he did in the 90s. It's, this is an olive bet. This is a, a very common thing with calligraphers, just to make, make, make a piece of art that is just the letters of the olive bet or the alphabet um, done in a very creative and unique style. So this is a cursive olive bet with a small quote from Rebbe Nachman, man must renew himself constantly. And here the medium and the message go together because First of all, he's working with cursive Hebrew script, which is not as often, as far as I know, the basis for calligraphic exploration in the Hebrew language. And here, even, even when he writes in the block script, he uses, he puts in one cursive style letter, just a little surprise. But even the tool he's using is rather unconventional. This is a nail board, like what you'd use for filing your nails. And so he uses that to generate these letters. Uh, and he's very much here inspired by Japanese Zen calligraphy. Uh, and, and the way I looked at this also is he's varying the colors, almost like the rainbow after the flood, which was shown to Noah. So again, this theme of renewal, that the, the text is about constantly making something new and so the art, even the way the art is done and the shapes of the letters is reflecting that important message. All of all these, there's these connections between the form and the content and the process. <clears throat> and, and calligraphy has the potential to bring all of those together in very playful and inventive ways. The last piece that I was delighted to include is by Sophie Verbeek. She's French, and she's not ordinarily a Hebrew calligrapher, but she was asked to do a commission for a, a well-known rabbi. And this is a line from Shir Hashirim, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. And here, another theme and variations, the same line written many times in different styles to bring out different feelings, different ways to emote this, this very powerful line of poetry. Her Hebrew lettering, I love because it's very, it's very fluid. The letters kind of look like they're underwater, they're moving, they're dancing. And this is, I think, very evocative of Gina Jonas's Hebrew lettering. Um, and then even the way that she wrote this line there's many different rhythms here. In this writing in particular, you have these wide letters, the M, the Y, the C, and then these very quick, narrow letters, the A here and cannot, or the O. This is a, a kind of many rhythms or maybe even a sort of jazz look to how 
the, the rhythm, the tempo of a line of calligraphy can, can read and can sound when you're reading it and, and sounding it out loud in your head. So each one of these pieces brings out a different element of how calligraphy can work. And in, in each of these, I'm, I'm hoping that as you look at them, you, you see, you get some sense of what calligraphy can do. It's often, calligraphy is often seen as just a kind of craft or it's just beautiful lettering. And it is beautiful lettering, but I think there's a lot more to it than just something that's pretty or ornamental. And each of these works by different calligraphers working in Hebrew brings out a different element in that. So I believe that Judith and Aaron have some questions, and then I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks. Uh, yes, first of all, Jonathan, I want to thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. I have spent some time with this work, but I appreciate each piece so much more after hearing you speak about it. So uh, you touched on a lot of issues from uh, the content to the form, and I really um, I got a lot out of it, so thanks. Um, my question for you is, as a contemporary calligrapher, I've noticed that despite the fact that we live in a pretty secular world, a lot of the calligraphy that's done today is in a religious context. I'm not talking about wedding invitations and things like that, but things that are done as art pieces really are often in a religious context. Can you, do you have some thoughts about why that is? That's a very good question. I think one is that the, when, when calligraphers are doing something that's really working with a text or meditating on a text, they're gonna to wanna to pick a text that's momentous and important. I mean, unless you're doing wedding invitations. So, and I think in, in Judaism in particular, uh, there's, there's a sort of interplay between Sofrut and Hebrew calligraphy. I, I will say working with the St. John's Bible, it was something new. It hadn't been done in centuries. And the thinking was in part that when Gutenberg came and printed Bibles became mass produced among Christians, the skill set of calligraphy was not as necessary. But among Jews, it, you know, the Torah scroll has to be written by hand. The mezuzah has to be written by hand. So, you know, even though I think in Germany was it was some group that programmed a robot, a robotic arm to write a Torah scroll, and it was faster and it made no mistakes. But it's not kosher because it has no, it has no intention. It doesn't understand what it's doing. So, I think it, part of it is that in Judaism, there's a sort of interesting interplay between the the ritual craft of sofrut, which keeps some calligraphic tradition alive. If you have a Jewish community with, uh, with working Torah scribes, you have people who know calligraphy. And I think that the kind of enables and interplays with the more personally expressive side of calligraphy that is not as, uh, not as kind of halakhically, what's the word I'm looking for? Halakhically purposive as a Torah scroll. So it's no coincidence, for example, here's Avraham Borshevsky on the right, here's a mezuzah he did. Izzy Pludwinski also, um, I found this on his Instagram. This is from an, uh, a Megillah to Esther. He also trained as a sofer. And Rabbi Wolf Prusan did Ketubot, which don't have to be written by hand, but it's, it's another kind of ritual craft that relates to an artistic expressive side of Jewish tradition as well. And you could, you could get into Hidur Mitzvah uh, in discussing this. There's a parallel even among some of the Christian works that were in the exhibit. What this one that I'm, people were particularly enthused about is by Georgia, Georgia Angelopoulos. She is a Greek Canadian calligrapher and a lot of her work, at least this piece, is playing with iconography and the, the tradition of icons in Orthodox Judaism, which are also not really seen as, as expressive art. They're also a kind of very, very regulated or, or very traditional kind of ritual craft. But in her use of gold and her use of lettering, she's very much evoking that style. 
So there, there's a sort of art and craft conversation here. And I, I think there's, there's a lot more that could be said about this that so far, I think I, I haven't seen it being written about. Although if you are curious, Shoshana Guggenheim Kedem's Open Studios talk for Jewish Art Salon. She also works at the interplay of, of so fruits and artistic calligraphy as well. Thank I just want to Judy. point out that um, you misspoke and you mentioned this in the context of Orthodox Judaism. And I think you meant- Oh, uh, right. I meant, I meant Orthodox Greek Christian. Orthodox Christianity. Yeah. Yes. No, I don't think Orthodox wondering. Jews. I, I don't know any Orthodox Jews with an icon of St. Lawrence. Wait, St. Lawrence wasn't Jewish? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Jonathan, um, do you want to speak a little more about the interreligious dimension? I mean, I think it's so interesting that even in this lecture you showed us that there's, there's the uh, Jewish-Christian dialogue that you set out to evoke um, at the core of your, your show, but there's, it's also interesting to see how porous those boundaries are and not mm -hmm. only to one another, but to other traditions and inspiration from um, Zen arts uh, in particular and what makes um, calligraphy such a great medium for exploring those interconnections because maybe some people would think initially, well, if you're taking inspiration from direct sacred text, there would be um, less play, less opportunity, but it seems like you're showing us that there's so much more that we can get in these interconnections sort of between the lines as it were. That's a very good question. Many of the artists in this, uh, in this exhibit directly named artists or aesthetic traditions from other religious communities or artists from other religions that inspire them. Uh, one of the ones that really tickled me when I learned about it is um, Peretz Wolf Prusan mentions when he was growing up, I believe in, in Los Angeles or nearby, Sister Corita Kent was, was kind of in her prime of doing her work. And she was a Roman Catholic nun and did these sorts of pop art inspired works with, with subtle or not so subtle religious and political messages. So this one is enriched wonder bread, that super white bread that I guess you can still buy. But of course, this is being made by a Catholic nun. So there's all the, the overtones of the bread as the body of Christ and the Eucharist that's also coming into this. Um, so I, I wanna be careful here and say, I'm not, I'm not claiming that these artists are, are to, maybe drawing on ideas from other religious traditions. I don't think I can speak for them, but sometimes just the aesthetics of another tradition can be useful and generative sites of, of dialogue between artists of different religions or between aesthetics of different religions. Um, so this is one example. And another example, Ludwinski is often said, he's very, he actually calls it Zen Hebrew calligraphy. So here on the right is uh, a Japanese Buddhist calligraphy and on the left, his work very much inspired by the, the way that this calligraphy is the, the dance of the scribe's body on the page, the embodiment of it, and sort of the expressiveness of your intention and your emotions is a part of the work. And as much a part of the work as the meaning of the words and sometimes even the letters are, I don't, sometimes in this way of doing calligraphy, the legibility is not necessarily the most important part. Um, and it's interesting how things come full circle because Izzy Pludwinski did work on the St. John's Bible. He was hired to do Hebrew letterheads for books of the Christian Old Testament. So here, in, here's Kohelet, Shir Hashirim, and this, this goes right back to the Middle Ages, where we certainly have examples of medieval Hebrew manuscripts made by Jews, where maybe a Christian was commissioned to do the illuminations. That there's a lot more interplay and interaction than people often realize um, in the medieval world. So I hope I answered your question well. I also see uh, Richard McBee has his hand up. But Judith, I'm going to let you uh, I'm going to let you moderate the Q&A. Yeah, I think um, if you have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. You can also use the little, you know, click on the little icon to raise your hand, or you can uh, 
if there's a lull, he want to jump in verbally, you can do that. So let's begin with Richard. Go ahead and ask your question, Richard. Hi, first of all, a, a stunning presentation to say the least, uh, uh, but it's very, very curious. Uh, this morning, uh, there was a meeting of another group <clears throat> uh, called the Freedman Society, which is a group of uh, basically uh, Judaica collectors, uh, and their lecture was on amulets, uh, an expert in essentially Italian amulets uh, from 16th through, let's say, 19th century, uh, and a long, long discussion afterwards. And one of the things that came out was that amulets, and talked about various kinds of amulets within the Jewish tradition, and, but of course, amulets are also used, these kinds of things are used extensively in Catholic uh, tradition, and the point, it was pointed out that at times, uh, you would have a Jewish amulet being used in a Christian home, and then vice versa, because of the belief that these, that these uh, objects have uh, magical pro uh, properties and that are effective and uh, kind of cross uh, our interfaith. Uh, and so in a funny way, this back and forth um, between what you're seeing here in terms of the calligraphy is really a f a f uh, being reflected in, um, in the amulet world. Just a comment. It reminds me yes. of an article I read in the New York Times about Mizuzot left behind in New York City apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. And Definitely there were Jews who felt you should not leave these behind if the next occupant of the apartment is not Jewish. And I, I want to acknowledge and name that, that there, there kind of are boundaries here, but there were definitely also Catholics, Protestants that they interviewed who lived in these apartments that had mezuzot left by previous owners. And they said, well, it's, it's good luck. I feel protected. God is with me. So there is a sort of interchange between the two as, as well. It's wonderful. Rachel Braun has a question. Rachel, do you want to uh, unmute yourself, please, and ask your question? Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to the materials, the papers, the inks, and the parchment. So every every artist here does have a, a different tool set. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, some of them are working with sofa ink. Some of them are working with gouache. Some of them are working with more water-based inks, uh, kind of like fountain pen inks, I think. So it's it's kind of hard to generalize. Uh, Shoshana, I see that you have your hand up. Would you like to unmute, please, and ask your question? Um, Jonathan, first of all, thank you for the very beautiful uh, presentation. I would like to talk with you more, and I gave you my email address in the chat, because I'm an Orthodox artist, and I made a Haggadah and many other callig calligraphic works to show how an Orthodox artist works with it, and with my European background also incorporates medieval texts and things that I saw, so please contact me later. Okay, I will do, thank you. I'm just thinking about um, doing this ancient craft in the contemporary world. It often strikes me just how um, backward I am as I dip my nib into a bottle of ink. And of course, I've, I've become interested in digital art as well. So it, it, it feels like a great divide. Can you speak to um, the experience of being a calligrapher in today's world, the benefits or or the, the limitations. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I've, most calligraphers I have talked to would mention at least one limitation is um, the, the inability to make a living. <laughs> and I, I do know there are a few calligraphers in this call. So if anybody else wants to speak to this, you can. I think one thing that I hear again and again is just when things seem very quaint or old fashioned or irrelevant, perhaps they're more needed than ever. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's being physically present, being embodied are both really important. And with the work of calligraphy, the, the scribe's body is very present. It's, it's very personal in a way that typing something on a computer just I don't think gets you. That's my bias. So, you know, you, you could say quaint or you, you could say old fashioned, but you could also say more needed than ever. I see a lot of heads nodding in agreement with you. And I often think too about handwriting and 
we see less of it today, but oftentimes, especially if somebody's passed away and you you catch sight of their handwriting on a piece of paper, you get this visceral response. It's almost like the person is in the room with you. So there is a, you know, if you think about it, there's a physical link of, because the hand of the person actually touched the paper and made the, the shapes that you're seeing. So I think that certainly is present in, a, in an actual work of art that isn't uh, digitally or electronic, you know, uh, can, mechanically reproduced. So I think people want that connection. I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think it's going to fade away. In fact, um, I did a, a little blog. Oh, go ahead. Please. Oh, I, not at all. There's yeah, a just... reason people are still forging authentic JFK letters, things like that. I mean, pe people pay a lot for someone's autograph or someone's Especially if they're queuing on Jonathan, because he's coming back. Um, but, um, and I, I would say in terms of the handwriting, Judith, just a personal note that, um, that that is so uh, evocative to me, um, having lost my sister, that when we find, we finding um, where she'd carved her name into a cabin that the family has, and uh, I probably shouldn't admit this as a Jew, but my, uh, the one and only tattoo I have is my, um, uh, my sister's name from a letter she wrote to, to me. Um, and um, and so I can and so seeing her handwriting on the flesh is something that's very powerful to me, and I thought of that a lot in Jonathan's exhibit with the work of um, uh, the Song of Songs in particular. Um, the set me as a seal upon your heart and upon your arm, and um, and it's been interesting to see how many artists have have taken those in literal and then metaphorical loops um, as well. Right. Actually, and that set me as a seal line is so often used. Uh, to refer to wrapping to fill in. So it goes, goes full circle. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Judith. Sorry. No, not at all. Um, there actually is quite a lot of uh, things being written about the fact that tattoos are not so forbidden in Judaism. I'll just throw that out there. Don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, so Aaron, talk about a little about um, the reception of this exhibit in your in the Loose Center and responses to it um, uh, among non calligraphers, perhaps. How what do you what kind of buzz are you getting, if any? Oh gosh, you know, as you can tell, people love um, uh, love Jonathan. He's been such a great voice in our um, Loose Center dialogues, and um, you can see that in the also, especially when people get a chance to hear him speak about these kind of works. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this is a great teaching resource for, uh, for our seminary. And so we show uh, Jonathan's exhibit in our classes. And Jonathan actually did double um, duty this morning by speaking to my wife as an Episcopal priest. So we spoke to her congregation. I think there might be a couple of friends from the congregation on this call. And so he's been talking about them and, and uh, to them about calligraphy and sort of meditation and things apropos the Advent season. And so it's just a wonderful way to open up into religious dialogue. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do as a seminary, and we've um, I've had great conversations with some of you folks here from the Jewish Art Salon about this, is ways to uh, increase Jewish literacy in Christian context, because so often we think that those dialogues should either be at a at a neutral venue, um, or the um, the key is to get um, non Jews into Jewish spaces to educate them. But it's also important to really develop those the, that tool those tools of interreligious dialogue. But just that engagement and passion within seminary and to engage with Jews qua Jews, not just as Saint Augustine would say, as the librarians of us. Uh, scripture. Um, and so, so this is a, a, just a prototypical kind of resource that we'd want to use to get students thinking and to use their biblical literacy and then push that in directions they might not be quite as accustomed to. So it's been terrifically well received. Fantastic. And I, I know this is outside the purview of this exhibition, but of course, in Islam, calligraphy is extremely important. And just a little, um, a little plug for our next program will be on December 26th and we're going to feature art from the Jerusalem Biennale and one of the exhibits um, in, is um, Lenore Mizrahi Cohen who collaborated with uh, Islamic artists from the uh, United Arab Emirates and there is some uh, Arabic calligraphy as well as Hebrew calligraphy in the exhibit. So that's, that is a place where I think Jews and Muslims can, can come together too as the love of calligraphy. It can build understanding. Judith, I, I see a Serena 
There's a new hand up. Great. Why don't you? Yes, uh, I, unmute? I, I had a, I had a question. Um, you know, I'm an artist, a visual painter, and I've recently been studying Asian calligraphy, Chinese calligraphy, and I find it is very helpful in terms of understanding, first of all, learning the skill of, of the brush stroke and learning how to translate that to other visual um, forms of painting. Uh, so I'm just wondering in terms of um, Judeo Christian or, um, script, if there's any uh, overlap there and has it ever been even thought of as a means of learning how to use the skills of the script to translate, uh, let's say the sign of a bird or whatever, um, the, the skill of learning these um, figures that you use in calligraphy can be translated to being able to draw and paint if one can think that way and can uh, also uh, be able to transmit it into representational objects, which I know that in Judaism, that's a big issue. That's a, a very good question. Two things come to mind. One is, Certainly the, the awareness that many of the Hebrew letters from the, the distant past in the square script come from ideograms, from images of things. So, you know, mm -hmm. why, why do we call a bet a bet? So oh, it looks like a little house. Um, and also there's the whole medieval tradition of micrography in right. Hebrew manuscripts with the, the scribes writing very very small letters to fashion larger designs, patterns. Uh, a very good contemporary example of that, if anyone's curious, I'll just put it in the chat. Fred Pauker's uh, Traveler's Prayer. This, I believe, was a commission. He, oh, sorry, autocorrect. Fred Pauker, I mean, you can just Google it. It was a commission in, I believe, the 70s or 80s from uh, El Al, and they wanted, uh, it, it's the traveler's prayer, but it's in the shape of two birds. So this tradition continues. And I, I think there's always, you know, letters are made with lines and drawings are made with lines. So there's always going to be some amount of interplay between the two. Just Googling that prayer to see if I can pull that up for everybody. If you want to, if you want to share screen, it's quite yeah. beautiful. Um, unfortunately, the artist is no longer alive. It's the kind of thing that would have been perfect in the exhibit, but I wanted all the artists to be living because I really wanted it to be contemporary. Any other questions for Jonathan? Or comments that you'd like to make? Um, I, I just have a quick, what's funny, you should mention the um, uh, micrography. Uh, are you aware of, because obviously that's calligraphy, uh, and it's also very much, it's one of these things that crosses boundaries. It, go, it comes, it's, it's text, it's image, uh, it, in, it uses figuration, uh, even human figuration. Uh, so are you aware of any uh, contemporary calligrapher or artist who is doing micrography today? I think actually it is still practice but i was wondering your comments on that carol mann is in the chat and if people are curious to look up her work she is doing a fusion of hebrew and chinese calligraphy because she's she's jewish and she's from hong she's in hong kong so her two heritage is coming together so there's there's always more of this happening yes i see a plug for izzy pludwinski's book and that's it the, the Tefillat Haderech. And if anyone is curious about Hebrew calligraphy, Izzy Podwinski's book is a very good place to start. Not only because it's all about the technique, but because he has tons of images of contemporary and medieval Hebrew calligraphy. So you get a sense of who different people are, who the different artists are and what they're doing. Noreen has a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself, please, Noreen, and ask yeah. your question. Um, Thank you very much. I've been trying to track down and research um, um, Hebrew responses to the Psalms. Um, 
I'm specifically, I, I'm very familiar with the Book of Kells. I'm, uh, I'm an Irish Jew. Um, so uh, I was interested, I, I'm interested in that in that there was a lot of, and this is also true with the Ethiopian Psalsters that were done in like 12th through the 15th century, that people would, uh, men would join the orders and they would prepare for a long period before they ever reached doing a page. So I'm fascinated with the rabbis and the others who joined in your exhibition about the preparation of the self. And Judith, if you could speak to this, the preparation of the self to do this work, um, that, that um, not only is the lettering an embodiment, but I would think there would have to be also um, a space in the artist's head. If, you know, anyway. You're absolutely right. Um, for me, um, calligraphy is a devotional act. I have to say though that any art that I do pretty much is on that level. But when I sit down to write a ketuba text, I say the Shehechianu first. Um, it's, it feels like a holy moment. And um, saying the Shehechianu uh, expresses my gratitude that I do the work that I do. I feel so fortunate and blessed and um, it sanctifies the moment. It helps me kind of focus my mind um, and it's a little superstitious because I don't want to make mistakes. <laughs> so yeah, it's all of those things. Jonathan, do you have uh, feelings about how you feel when you do calligraphy? Uh, yeah, your comment uh, <laughs> comment reminded me, even Christian monks, there, there was a tradition of uh, a sort of patron, a patron, you know, like this patron saints, a patron demon of calligraphy that if a monk made a mistake, you could blame. And it just occurred to me, I, I wonder um, if the Jews had a, a patron demon of calligraphy too. <laughs> I don't know. So Noreen, you ask a good question. And I think, I think of this in two ways. One is certainly in, in so fruit in halakhic literature, there's a, a good deal of emphasis on that the person who does this work must be respected and must be trusted in part because you don't want them to cut corners with it you know if you have a if you have a torah scroll and there's careless misspellings or letters that are carelessly written this is this is a problem both for this halakhically but also are are you able to actually read from it in the Torah reading. Another way I think about it though, calligraphy requires a great attention to others how to focus. And I do I do wonder if there's some connection between that and, and sort of halakhic ideas of, of kavana, of intention, of being mindful of what you're doing at all times. So I, I think there may also be a way that the calligraphy is a, a moral formation or a spiritual formation as well. And ideas I'm curious about if that the... resonates with you, Judith. Absolutely. Go ahead, Aaron. Oh, whether the letters themselves also conform people, like especially some theological thinking about the letters then being a kind of stricture it's in, in self-imposing a discipline. And that conversation reminds me of, you know, a question, you know, because Judith, we had just a little sidebar there about Sumi'i ink painting and the idea that you, in there you paint, as many of you will know, I mean, that you're doing ink on, on a paper that is meant to be one where you can't go back and fix your mistakes. And it's interesting how many of these art forms are about, um, either about a kind of carefulness that you prepare to do something really intently or that you prepare the self with that kind of studiousness so that then you have the liberation to proceed uncarefully as it were um, and, and to be okay with that. That's exactly how I describe it when I teach sumie, which is a Japanese ink brush painting. And I use that as a technical preparation for watercolor painting. Um, and ink is a cruel mistress, it's permanent. So you have to really prepare yourself for that stroke. But I, I describe it as like learning how to dance. 
you, you memorize a dance step and you're very self-conscious and counting steps and everything, but then it becomes second nature. And then you can express yourself freely. And calligraphy is like that. And calligraphy actually has a somatic um, connection because as you train your body to do these, the letter forms, which at first you have to memorize, but then they come sort of unconsciously and naturally, um, there's a mind-body connection because it, the, the action of doing the calligraphy trains your hand and it also um, is, it primes the pump for creativity. And I always tell people, if you don't have any creative ideas, just start painting or start doing some lettering and just the action of doing it will, will get you started. So I'm sure Jonathan, that you can relate to that because you also uh, do this kind of work. You know, I, I'm not, I'm gonna be very honest. I'm quite an amateur calligrapher, but I think if you're studying an art form and writing about it, even if you're totally amateur at it, practicing it at all, knowing that the tools that the scribes are working with, knowing the, the choices they make, it's really helpful to understand what they're doing. I'm not putting any stuff up here. I think a lot of people of art would say the same thing. <laughs> Most definitely. I'm just checking the chat to see if we have any more questions. Yes, Judith, uh, Judith, there are three people that are raising hand very quietly. Oh, so, okay. okay. You, well, Dorit, I don't see them. So will you call on them? This Carmi uh, uh, and Trishana. Um, Hi. Just, yeah. Hi. Go ahead, Carmi. I'm Carmi Plow. Love this conversation. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so uh, as of the beginning of Bray Sheet this year, my brother asked me to do a weekly Parsha drawing for his Torah study group, uh, which happens to be in uh, the big island Hawaii, which is pretty exciting to do it, but to discipline myself to do it. So I start to incorporate uh, putting lines of the text into the weekly Parsha and you know, I, I asked a few of them what they thought with, without, uh, you know, a lot of the drawings are digitally, a little bit of watercolor, but, um, and just experimenting with this idea of having the text in the foreground, in the, in the background, subliminal, opaque, there's something very spiritual and powerful about having the text versus not having the text, but it changes the art form completely. And just wanted to piggyback that statement onto what Jonathan said about this idea of the spirituality of the page and what we see on it and how the letters and the words actually affect, affect the, the, the whole feeling and, and of, you know, of what the art is. Just an adjunct to that too, I used to fool around with this concept when I was in Yerushalayim once, don't tell anybody, but it took a little handful of dirt from not too far away from the hotel. And I took a little bit of the dirt and I mixed it in with my paint and, you know, became part of the painting, but there was something more magical about it. Was it like words? No, it wasn't. But it's something about incorporating this, as a holiness and kadosh to the, to the particular art form with letters in particular is just, it, it feels very significant. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, do you have thoughts about mm. materials? I'm thinking about that. I'm intrigued by the tradition of the um, white fire and I'm intrigued by the idea that you know the, the black ink, the carbon ink that so much calligraphy uses is soot. It comes out of fire. So there's something there about the, the destruction of fire, burning something creates the soot that allows the creation of these beautiful letters. I, I, I'm very into materials and I recently made some um, black walnut ink and as opposed to the soot coming from the fire, um, the, you can think about the black walnut ink as ink that comes from the tree of life. So that's another thing that I, a lot of Hebrew calligraphers and many artists over the years used. I think uh, Leonardo da Vinci used walnut ink. It's, it's very nice. 
in some medieval Jewish manuscripts, a, uh, a nut was a kind of symbol of the Torah because it has to be cracked open to gain the wisdom. So you'd have these manuscripts where there'd be a squirrel cracking open a nut and it's like an allegory of, of rabbis cracking open a page and studying it and um, working hard to get to the kernel of meaning. You know, I've seen those squirrels and I, I never knew why. <laughs> Go ahead, Aaron, were you speaking? Oh, sorry, just a tiny uh, interfaith connection. The um, uh, nuts were also a key thing of, of devotional um, uh, art in the, especially the German high Renaissance, uh, medieval and high Renaissance period of little tiny nut carvings uh, um, that people could take with them. Um, and they now go for <laughs> billions of dollars, by the way, at auction. <laughs> but um, but there, there's a lot to be said there. Well, we're kind of coming to the end of the program. So I just want to give anybody uh, an opportunity to ask a question if you didn't have one before. I don't see any hands up. Doreen, correct me if I guess I'm looking at one screen, not the next one. Oh, go ahead, Roger. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Hello, Jonathan. This has been um, a wonderful, wonderful series. Thank you, Judith and the studio and the salon. Uh, just a quick footnote. I think it was Noreen that mentioned a moment ago, some interest in Christian response to the Psalms. And uh, some of you may know, and I have a good friend in the UK, Malcolm Geit, who is a noted poet. And he's just published a book called David's Crown. And it's all, it's his, it's his uh, poetic responses to all 150 Psalms. And uh, those of you who know poetry, perhaps better than I, there, there's a particular form at, that he used uh, to respond to the Psalms in words rather than calligraphy, uh, where he picked up on the last phrase, the last verse or phrase of the Psalm to be the beginning of the next poem. So they're, they're all, all 150 are totally linked together as, as one long sonnet. Uh, so I'll put that in the chat before we go, but some of you may be interested in, and there may be some artistic response to that too, in something visual. Thank you, Roger. Actually, I just did put it in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So Jonathan and Aaron, I think we are at the top of the hour. I'd like to thank you very much for a fabulous program. I learned so much and I feel, I feel like I just, I'm just going to break out my ink in a minute, getting much applause. And I would like to invite everybody here to attend our next Jewish Art Salon Open Studios program, which will be at the same time on Sunday, December 26th. We are going to share um, art from the Jerusalem Biennale 2021. And we will be joined by our special guest, Rami Ozeri, who is the director of the Biennale and also curators Emily Bilski and Devorah Liss, who are gonna talk about exhibits that they curated. And we will also share uh, more artists. Uh, there are 18 artists from the Jewish Art Salon participating in the Biennale. So thank you so much for joining us. And Jonathan, that was fabulous. And thank you, Aaron, it was awesome. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, thank you for, thank you for inviting me.